Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. One year after an HIV outbreak, a rural Indiana community grapples with its new reality. I wish people would open their eyes especially after everything we went through, so they don't have to go through that either. We take you back to Austin, where nearly 200 people are now living with HIV. Plus, the city of Bloomington is taking aggressive action to address rising levels of pollutants in its water. I think we are in the path to fix that. It is not at a level that's dangerous. Um, it's, I want to have complete transparency so people know what's going on. Just ahead, how safe is Bloomington's water? And with the primary just over a week away, presidential hopefuls try to win over Hoosiers. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. One year after an HIV outbreak in southern Indiana made national headlines, nearly 200 people in Scott County are living with the virus. Hundreds of people there were injecting a prescription painkiller called Opana and sharing their needles. So HIV spread quickly among drug users, resulting in the largest outbreak the country's seen in decades. As Barbara Brozier reports, much has changed in the years since then, but Austin still has a long way to go. When HIV came to Austin last year, it didn't come quietly. It tore through the community, starting with five cases, exploding to 30, eventually multiplying until now more than 190 people are infected, all in a town of less than 5,000. Small, sleepy Austin got the most brutal of wake-up calls. But over the past year, change has slowly crept into this community. This Michael Steele lives within the 10-block radius, considered the heart of the outbreak. He sees a difference compared to last April. Back then, the streets in his neighborhood were a whole lot busier. Well, I'd see uh, prostitution, drug dealing going on. In the middle of the day, all day long. Certainly you still see people, just not nearly as many. It's gotten a lot better in the past year. Police are doing more patrols, which I'm glad to see. Trying to cut down on the drugs and the crime around here. Most of the users here are hooked on the potent painkiller Opana. They melt off its plastic coating, then inject the liquid, providing a high unlike any other painkiller. Police made it their mission to crack down on the people bringing the drugs to Austin. And that's making it a lot harder for those who depend on the drug, which raises a new problem. A lot of people tell me that it's not like some of the older pain medicines they, that they were addicted to because with this one, they can't withdraw from it. The withdrawal symptoms are so severe that they feel like they're gonna die. So users are turning to what they can get off the streets. First, that was methamphetamine, now heroin. It's totally a new challenge, yeah. It totally changed the whole dynamic. And with the heroin, we don't know what they're getting or what, you know, what it's laced with or what it, what's in it. And so they don't even know. And so our chances of overdose, too, you know, are going up. We're really worried about that. And that's just one of the many realities public health nurse Brittany Combs grapples with every day. I know we have like 300 some odd labs that we have to go through right now. She's unsure what the county's current hepatitis C rate is because there's hardly enough time to keep up with all of the testing. She's busy running what became the state's first syringe exchange program after the outbreak last year. More than 380 people signed up and about half of them are still actively using the program. 
Combs says the situation in Austin is improving, but there's still what seems like a never-ending list of issues to address. We need dental care. I mean, their teeth are a nightmare. And you know how it is when you have a, ba a bad tooth. It hurts. And so when all their teeth hurt, can you imagine living like that every day? So we need dental care. You know, we need... We need, we need a lot of things, but we've come a long way in one year, but we still have a long way to go. There are so many layers to the story in Austin. So many examples of how the community feels it was failed. Before the outbreak happened, Scott County ranked dead last in an annual report of the state's health outcomes for several years in a row. Its rate of premature death is the worst in the state and has increased every year since 2007. Nearly 15% of the people in the county are living in poverty. And those are problems that can't be solved without more time and money. Really, for drug use or sexual health or public health generally, all of those things depend on investment. And in our state, we invest $13.08 per person on public health. That includes Medicaid. I mean, I spent that last week at Starbucks. One year after the HIV outbreak, change has crept into Austin, but crisis hasn't left. The take home message from this is our system is broken and we can expect then bad health outcomes unless we really want to invest in it. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. Scott County is waiting on state approval to continue its syringe exchange for a second year. Next week, we'll take you back to Austin and explore how health care workers are addressing the long-term needs of the community. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Some Indiana conservation officers are armed with a new tool to protect others while on the job. The Department of Natural Resources says officers in northwest Indiana are carrying the overdose intervention drug naloxone. They went through training to learn how to administer the drug, which they carry in the form of a nasal spray. DNR officers say they could be the first on the scene of an overdose in the rural areas they cover. They move, the move serves as the latest illustration of the drug's increasing availability availability, which blocks the effects of opioids such as heroin, morphine, and oxycodone. Police will search the social media accounts of one-year-old Shaylin Ammerman's family as part of their investigation into her murder. Police found Ammerman dead near rural, Go rural Gosport last month after she was reported missing. Earlier this week, a judge granted a search warrant request for Facebook book records of nine people connected to the toddler, including her mother, father, and paternal grandmother. Police will also search the social media records of Kyle Parker, the man accused of sexually assaulting and killing Shaylin. He pleaded not guilty to charges, including rape, murder, and kidnapping. Facebook has 20 days to hand over the records. This weekend marks the one-year anniversary of IU student Hannah Wilson going missing. She disappeared during Little 500 weekend in 2015. Police found her body in Brown County and arrested Daniel Messel for her murder. He's expected to go to trial in June. While police say overall crime was down during this year's Little 500 race, they responded to three reported rapes near Indiana University's campus. State excise police issued about 200 citations for violations such as underage drinking. You won't have access to some of your lawmakers' emails after the Supreme Court ruled legislators don't have to release them under the state's public records law. The court says to do so would violate the state constitution's separation of powers. Citizen advocacy groups, including the Citizens Action Coalition, filed a lawsuit to gain access to emails between a House Republican legislator and utility companies. The state's public records law exempts what's called legislative work product, but doesn't define what that is. The Indiana State Senate Tuesday kicked off a six-month-long committee to study issues with illegal immigration. The first committee meeting featured testimony from two expert witnesses who advocated for stricter immigration measures. The Kansas Secretary of State suggested Indiana should enact measures to require 
proof of citizenship when registering to vote and require all businesses to use E-Verify, which checks the legal status of a pr prospective employee. A representative from Indiana Undocumented Youth Alliance said lawmakers should instead focus on measures that she says will make Indiana the welcoming place it says it is. The committee will meet five more times before it's expected to send a full report to the legislature. Ten schools throughout the state are asking people to pay higher taxes to support construction projects or operating expenses. Brown County schools are asking voters to approve a referendum to help offset the cost of declining enrollment. The measure would increase taxes by eight cents for every $100 of a home's value. We haven't been able to pay our teachers what we think is a competitive uh, level of salary for several years now. So we've, we've lost ground. We've lost some quality teachers to some other school districts who can pay more. The 10 referenda being proposed throughout the state will appear on the ba ballot May 3rd. The state's new science standards include computer science for elementary and middle school students. This is the first time computer science has been required for younger grade levels. The new standards don't require schools to offer computer classes, but they do require schools teach critical thinking and familiarity with basic computing skills. An example of one standard is learning how to troubleshoot common hardware and software issues. And a student might master these types of problems using a math program on a class computer. Indiana is one of only a handful of states to have computer science standards for kindergarten through eighth grade students. A property rights battle over public access to Indiana's Lake Michigan shoreline is likely to go before the state Supreme Court. The state is filing its brief in that case this week with oral arguments expected by June. It stems from a 2013 lawsuit by Long Beach homeowners who say their property extends to the water. A Superior Court judge ruled against them last year, saying the public can use the beach below the high water mark. But advocacy groups like the Long Beach Community Alliance say that mark should be easier to define. The group argues the high water mark is where the lake bed ends and vegetation begins. Kmart is closing 68 stores across the country in 10 Sears stores. Employees who are eligible will receive severance packages or be offered positions at other Sears or Kmart stores. A company statement says the closings come from performance evaluations of timing and leases. Bloomington's East 3rd Street Kmart will close in July. The only other Indiana Kmart closing is in New Albany. Just last month, Sears announced it was closing its college mall location to make way for a Whole Foods grocery store. Thousands of firefighters are in Indianapolis for the Fire Department Instructor Conference. Vendors will set up shop in the convention center in Lucas Oil Stadium. Companies from around the country are, hand, are on hand showing off their latest products. The conference will have classroom sessions and hands-on opportunities. The convention wraps up tomorrow. A cold snap earlier this month did little damage to Indiana's winter crops. During the first two weeks of April, overnight temperatures dipped below freezing several times, leading to fears of crop loss. However, Purdue Extension says the recent warming trend has saved most of the state's winter wheat, forage, and fruit crops. The only report of any damage was some minor freeze burn. State climatologists say temperatures have been at or above seasonal averages over the last week and a half. The warm-up is expected to provide good conditions just in time for planting season. An Indiana University hydrologist is one of three scientists building a first-of-its-kind database of water temperature and flow for nearly every stream in the U.S. and Canada. The project just won a $1.6 million grant from the National Science Foundation. It aims to use data to better understand the behavior of animals like fish. And the fish will, in turn, help scientists better understand streams and rivers. Aquatic species need a certain amount of water, and that water must stay between a certain temperature range. This data set will help predict how those stream characteristics are changing and where aquatic species will move as, as a result. And Joe, they have really nice weather to be going out uh -huh. and doing all of that research lately. Boy, what a project, though. Amazing. Thank you, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. 
With the primary less than two weeks away, candidates are ramping up their efforts in Indiana. Several made stops in the Hoosier State this week. Coming up, we'll take you on the campaign trail. What's in the water? We look at a pollutant in Bloomington's drinking water that has been edging closer to the EPA limit and ask whether the city's efforts to bring that number down are having an impact. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. We are a nation of explorers. We seek new ways of living, of thinking, and of expressing ourselves. We take risks, we learn from experience, and we keep moving forward. That's why we encourage and celebrate the explorer in all of us. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 40, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. With Indiana's primary less than two weeks away, presidential hopefuls are making stops in the Hoosier State to try and woo voters. Republican Donald Trump was the first to make his way to Indianapolis on Wednesday. Thousands of people gathered at the state fairgrounds to hear Trump talk about the economy and trade. He mentioned the decision by Carrier Corporation to close its Indianapolis plant and move its operations to Mexico. And you know, when Carrier that left here goes to Mexico and they want to sell their product across the border and no tax, no nothing, we're going to say, sorry folks, we have a nice strong border, we have a nice beautiful wall, you're going to bring it across the border and we're going to charge you a 35% tax after what you did. Close to 60 protesters gathered at the event, holding signs, criticizing both Trump and Governor Mike Pence. Pence met with Trump privately before the event. Pence also met with Republican Ted Cruz, who was a special guest at the state's GOP dinner last night. Cruz addressed a crowd of about 800. Cruz showered Governor Pence with praise, calling him an incredible governor and saluting him for cutting taxes and expanding school choice. He says a Cruz presidency would follow that blueprint while lifting federal obstacles to similar policies at the state level. Let me tell you, the state of Indiana is going to play a pivotal role in this election. The entire country, her eyes are on the state of Indiana, the men and women in this room. Heidi and I, we are going to spend a lot of time here in Indiana working to earn your votes, barnstorming the state, holding town halls, holding rallies, asking for your support. Cruz says he will appeal Obamacare and abolish the IRS if elected. He also says he believes the GOP will lose the general election if Trump is selected as the nominee. And Ohio Governor John Kasich will make a stop in Indiana next week. Kasich will be at a town hall Tuesday at 11 a.m. in Noblesville at the Hamilton County Fairgrounds. In addition to president, arguably the second most watched race on the, on the Indiana primary ballot is for U.S. Senate. Republicans Marlon Stutzman and Todd Young are fighting to succeed Senator Dan Coats. They met Monday for their first and only televised debate. During the debate, Stutzman said Young is the so-called establishment candidate who won't help reform what Stutzman calls a broken system. Thank you, Congressman Stutzman. The two candidates are similar in many ways. They argue for lower taxes and reduced regulation. They tout support from anti-abortion groups and the NRA. But Stutzman says Young is the so-called establishment candidate who won't help reform what Stutzman calls a broken system. There's obviously a broken system in Washington, D.C. The establishment in Washington consistently picks winners and losers. And we've seen that the establishment has decided, uh, Mitch McConnell has decided to, to jump into the race here in Indiana to pick uh, his, his pick has been Congressman Young uh, here in the Senate race. I think it's up to Hoosiers to make that decision rather than for the establishment in Washington. 
Young says Stutzman, who first ran for office in 2002, is the real career politician. The establishment candidate is the career politician. You are the one who said you are against farm subsidies but pocketed a million dollar in farm subsidies. You're the one, Marlin, who, who, who criticized a candidate uh, who was running against you for moving, living outside of Washington, D.C. First thing you did when you were sworn in is bought an $800,000 mansion and moved your family to Washington, D.C. But Stutzman says he's always opposed farm subsidies and moved his family to D.C. to be closer to them while he serves in Congress. The two candidates seek to replace retiring Republican Senator Dan Coats. Stutzman may be in trouble with the Federal Election Commission after the debate, a post on his wife's Facebook page began raising eyebrows. In the post, Stutzman's wife hailed her family's trip to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in California. Documents obtained by the Associated Press show more than $2,000 for four airline tickets to Los Angeles paid for by the Stutzman campaign. FEC regulations forbid the use of campaign funds for personal expenses. Stutzman, who has run on a platform of reigning in spending, has reportedly spent over $300,000 on flights, vehicle charges, meals, and hotel stays from his campaign fund since 2010. The city of Bloomington pulled samples to check the levels of disinfection byproducts earlier this week. The city is fighting to keep those levels within the EPA standards. As J.D. Gray reports, the measurements taken this week will show whether the city's recent actions are affecting the levels. From the basement of the city's water treatment plant in a room filled with pipes, about 15 million gallons of water are headed out towards Bloomington residents and businesses every day. Water plays a large role in public health and the economy, and Bloomington is fighting to keep its water in line with federal regulations. Uh, when I came into office uh, January this year, a few months ago, I found out that our water system had this one aspect that was climbing toward the federal safety limits. And I immediately wanted people to know that and to let them know we're going to jump on this and, and uh, take care of it. Mayor Hamilton is referring to the level of disinfectant byproducts, or DBPs, in Bloomington's water. The DBPs are classified into two groups. They are either called haloacidic acids or trihalomethanes. Both types are created when disinfectants like chlorine interact with organic matter. Ingesting too many DBPs over time is linked to adverse health risks like cancer. Bloomington sources their drinking water from Lake Monroe, and it contains a lot of organic matter. And the source of the organic matter can be a broad range of possibilities. It could be natural things occurring in any watershed related to the growth of plant material, to algae growing in the lake, to microbial uh, organisms growing within the distribution system. Any one of those sources of organic material could be precursors to the formation of these disinfection byproducts. When the city pulls the water in from the lake, they use chlorine to kill microbes. The chlorine creates DBPs when they interact with organic matter. This month, the city made considerable changes to their process. They began removing some organic matter before adding the first dose of chlorine. They've also adjusted how much chlorine they use, and they've started flushing water mains throughout the city. If these approaches work, they could reverse a trend that has been going on for a long time. Bloomington Water's DBP levels have been rising for years. The data began to just creep up with each testing period. We noticed that you know, we were getting closer and closer. Um, I've written several memos, I mean tens, twenties, thirty memos regarding the issues over the years. The city is taking monthly samples of DBPs at eight locations throughout Bloomington, instead of just the quarterly tests that it performed in the past. Between January and March, the city saw its DBP numbers rise. The increases averaged between 10 and 20 parts per billion. For a lot of people, the big concern is whether or not Bloomington's water is safe to drink, and according to EPA standards, it is. The warmer weather means DBPs grow more quickly, but with many of the city's new strategies being implemented this month, it is unclear where the new numbers will lie. I take it very seriously. I take my job seriously, the community's public health seriously, and so I, I want to be able to sit down with you next month and you know show you how much lower we are. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic about you know sticking that out there before I have the data, but I know we're doing everything that we should be doing. The results for April's DBP levels are expected in the next three to six weeks. I'm holding my breath again, but this time 
um, I feel a little bit more optimistic about what re results are going to look like. For Indiana News Desk, I'm J.D. Gray. At says if the city exceeds the EPA limit, the violation will be recorded with the State Department of Environmental Management and the EPA. At says the city is releasing the data, good or bad, so it can easily monitor the progress being made. Results are posted on the city's website. You can find a link on our website at WTIUNews.org. We have one more poll you might be interested in watching on May 3rd. The Indianapolis Zoo is inviting the public to help choose a name for their new baby orangutan. Thousands of guests have already seen the first Sumatran orangutan born at the Indianapolis Zoo. Five names have been pre-selected and the option that receives the most votes will become the baby's name. You can vote on the zoo's Facebook page. The final results will be announced on May 3rd. What about that? So if you're not into politics, you can start yeah, thinking about a name for the new baby at the Indianapolis Zoo. And they have all the, the meanings behind the names posted. So that's how I would vote for the <laughs> meaning that, that I like most. So voting continues through noon on May 2nd. So get your vote in. Right. And that's the end of this program. But our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.